Great. Well, thanks for your patience and thanks for joining NSBA again uh, to the PPP discussion we're going to have on the second round. Um, I'm Molly Day again here with NSBA. Uh, we're a staunchly nonpartisan organization that has provided critical input on what small businesses need through the pandemic. Today, we're going to talk with NSBA President Todd McCracken and Marilyn Landis, owner of Basic Business Concepts, a company that provides CFO level advice to small firms. Uh, Marilyn, if, you know, if any of you have joined us in past webinars, has been really critical in helping us understand what the, what the legislation means and you know, kind of understand some of the nuances in terms of what you should expect as, as a borrower. <clears throat> so Todd and, and Marilyn are going to talk about this, uh, the new PPP that was um, signed into law um, right before the holidays, and um, we, we are expecting regulations relatively soon, but I think Todd's going to uh, touch on some of that. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Everybody is muted. Um, the only people you should see on the, on the video are uh, Todd, myself, and Marilyn, uh, as well as our PowerPoint slides. So um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Todd. If you do have questions, please do your best to put those into the Q&A. That helps us best prioritize questions as they come in. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me a quick email at mday at nsba and with that um todd let's turn it over to you to for a quick uh, status update on where things stand you think i've been doing this long enough to know i mute myself uh but uh thanks paul i maybe you can just go to the next slide and we can sort of talk about uh sort of the update and um what happened last year uh, as, as uh i'm sure most of you know there was a significant uh paycheck protection uh, program, loan program last year that, that got out ultimately uh, 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 over $500 billion in, in loans to small business, most of which either has been or will be forgiven uh, as people apply for it. Um, and, and at the same time, we had a very large idle loan program, which is economic injury disaster loan, which are loans made directly from the SBA. The PPP loans, of course, were made through banks and guaranteed by the SBA. Um, so it was despite the hiccups, despite the late start, despite a lot of confusion and changing rules through the spring, it nevertheless was enormously successful in getting a lot of money in the hands of a lot of small companies that enabled them to to um, stretch their dollars a little bit further, uh, keep more staff on payroll, and and survive through a difficult time. But there were lots of lessons learned. And uh, uh, some of the early ones were that small companies were having a really hard time getting through and, and getting to the head of, f f front of the queue. A lot of the smallest businesses didn't have relationships with banks uh, and they had a, especially had a hard time uh, uh, getting served initially. Um, so there are th th things that's built to address that and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, there were some sort of arbitrary limits on on what the loan could be used for both what the in terms of the size of the loan and, the, and how the proceeds could be spent but also on how on limits on how it could be um forgiven and what could be forgiven under what terms um those have changed a bit also and i'll talk about that a little bit um and uh and then finally the tax treatment of the bill was confusing uh, excuse me the forgiveness was forgiving the initial law said that forgiveness would not be taxable income uh, which we thought was correct and we applauded at the time and and most small businesses began to count on that well then in the coming days the irs came back and said well that's fine maybe it won't be taxable income but the expenses that you uh have to uh, meet to achieve that forgiveness uh, will not be deductible. And of course, as any business person knows, a, the lack of uh, uh, a deduction uh, or the lack of taxable income is a distinction without a difference. So essentially, uh, the IRS took away what Congress had thought it was giving. Um, and that has been addressed in this bill as well. So let's talk about all those things a, a little, a little bit further, and what they, what they will mean uh, as you apply for these loans. First off, uh, uh, there are provisions in place that I think will help the smallest companies get to the head of the queue faster. First off, last time around, we saw a lot of companies uh, that uh, thought they were going to see a downturn that perhaps they didn't see. Uh, and there weren't clear standards for what kind of company uh, or what kind of economic downturn uh, would, would warrant a new loan. Um, and so some companies got loans that they ultimately 
decided they might not have actually needed because the downturn wasn't as great as they thought it was going to be for their particular company or other things. Uh, nevertheless, they got in line and they took a spot of somebody else and they used some of the money. Um, I think there'll be fewer of those companies this time because the, because the unknowns are less, the uncertainty is a little bit less. Um, and this time there is a standard in the bill that says that you need to have seen a revenue decline of at least 25% in one quarter of the year, at least, from, from, from the same quarter in 2019 in order to qualify. So it actually quantifies what they mean by needing the money and, and, and having uh, and being in economic distress. Secondly, the total, the maximum loan size has gone down. It was $10 million. They've lowered it dramatically to just $2 million. So a lot of those bigger companies that were getting loans before um, won't be eligible, at least for a large loan. Um, uh, and some of them might not think it's as, as worth doing. Um, not only that, but the size of company has gone down. They defined it before by either the SBA size standard or fewer than 500 employees, plus they are ultimately lax in uh, how, to, how to think about a particular location versus an overall business. This time they've narrowed down the rules a little bit more and, and, and you have to have fewer than 300 employees in addition to the maximum loan size of $2 million. On top of that, they've created a, a, a set aside. So a certain amount of money is just for companies that have 10 employees or fewer, plus a certain amount of money is just for community banks, which tend to loan in much higher rates to small companies and other larger businesses. So we think all those things together uh, will mean that there won't be as much of an initial log jam when these become available, A, and B, uh, they're more likely to go sooner to the companies uh, that actually need them the most and the smallest companies. Uh, secondly, the Congress did address the question of, of, uh, of uh, deductibility uh, in, the, in the bill, both for the uh, forgiveness from 2020 and also for the new program. Any proceeds that are in the form of forgiveness, loan forgiveness, will be non-taxable and the expenses related to them will be deductible, um, which is going to be uh, you know, a really a big help to small business community. It's going to help them with cash flow um, and it's going to help them uh, uh, with what they were expecting this bill would be in the first place. Um, the other thing that's been improved is for companies that are likeliest to be uh, um, in the greatest distress, uh, you know, specifically accommodation and food service companies, they can actually get a little bit bigger loan, uh, not just two and a half times, but three and a half times in it, their monthly payroll, I should say. Um, and in addition to that, um, uh, there are more things that are allowable for pay, for uh, for the loan. For instance, uh, uh, previously you couldn't even use loan proceeds to pay for upgrades to your business that you had to do in order to make it uh, um, uh, you know COVID friendly to you know put up put barricades, put up barriers, and make various changes that you might need. And maybe add tables outside of your restaurant, etc. None of those things were eligible for for PPP. Uh, proceeds to be used for, now they are. The new, and the new round, companies will be able to use their funds for those kinds of things. And also other debt obligations they have they can't get out of. They can also count that as well. Plus, the, the total amount that, that has to go to employees and, and payroll has gone down from 75% of total forgiveness to just 60. So a lot of those companies that have very high rent uh, and other obligations they can't get out of um, uh, will be in a little bit better spot this time than they were the last time. So all of those things, I think we're done. We're, we're pretty we're pretty pleased uh, that Congress has has you know taken seriously the, the very broad concerns that the small business community had and worked to try to address those. Again, this is not going to be perfect um, because uh, a, a speed is still of the essence. But I think it will be uh, 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 something that I think people will see has worked to address a lot of the problems and concerns we had in the past. Uh, I think I'll stop there because we want to make sure we have plenty of time for your questions. And I think uh, Marilyn's going to be in a spot to be a little bit more specific uh, and detailed in terms of what folks will be able to do. So uh, thanks, Molly. I think that's kind of the overview I wanted to give folks. Great. Thanks, Todd. You know, you mentioned some of the key problems uh, with the first round of the PPP. Did you want to elaborate on any of that uh, or, or do you feel like you covered that and then we can kind of take some additional questions? I, I think that I think that's been pretty well covered by what I talked about. So, 
Great. Well, with that, then I'd like to turn it over to um, Marilyn. As I mentioned at the top of the call, you are a resident lending expert and have joined us on these webinars um, since the very beginning. So, um, you know, can you A, look into your crystal ball uh, and B, kind of boil it all down and tell us what it means for your application process and, and what businesses should be expecting? Because I'm getting it from the clients I have across the country as I've worked with them in a CFO role as well as their banks and the work I do directly with lenders and so forth. So one of the things to keep in mind is the general, all the rules that were written for payroll protection still apply unless they were specifically changed or amended in this law. So a lot of the questions, we can still go back to the regs that were written over the summer if we have the detail. If it was changed in the law, then that's the only thing that has changed. But keep in mind that the regulation or the guidance hasn't come out yet. Why is that important? Well, last time Todd talked about the fact the percentage of the loan that had to go for payroll for forgiveness. Last time that was specified in regulation that had not been written into the law. So when the Treasury SBA slash Treasury actually wrote the rules, they were tighter than what the legislator had planned. Let me give you some examples of that, some of which Todd has already hit on. <clears throat> when the regulators wrote the rules for the first payroll protection loans, they, they set a threshold for how much of it had to go toward payroll that didn't work for small business, and this loan is corrected it by reducing it to 60%. <clears throat> Another example is this tax consequence that Todd talked about. Congress specifically said they did not want this to be a taxable event. The IRS said, well, our reg still applies. If it's not taxed income, it can't have deductions again. So this law took care of that. Another example is <clears throat> the first law originally gave SBA borrowers, these are people who had an SBA loan pre-COVID, it gave them a wonderful gift that helped their cash flow. It said the SBA will make your loan payments for you for six months. That's huge. I'm sure a lot of businesses survived because they were able to use that money to build the barriers they had to win their business or to take care of things they needed to do. And those loan payments were not simply pushed off, they were made for them. So at the end of that six month period, they didn't owe that money. <clears throat> but the IRS ruled that that money was actually uh, taxable income and they would have to claim that as taxable income. This law fixes it. This law clearly says it was not meant to be taxable income and it will not be taxable income. And in fact, the law actually extends the period where those payments will be paid for borrowers, automatically gives them another three months. And if the business is in an underserved market, uh, one of the more challenged economic markets, then they will consider giving them an additional five months after the automatic three months. So a lot of these things, keep in mind, were regulatory issues that stepped in that may not have complied directly with the law. The other thing was the original law said that the idle advance was a grant. And many of you have already been through this process. You found out that when you were forgiven, they subtracted the amount of the idle loan and that became a grant for you, or it became a loan for you. This law fixed that. So again, these were regulatory issues that had crept in after the law was written. So I caution, uh, when you're getting this flood of emails that's out there right now from CPAs, attorneys, and consultants, and everybody who's grabbing pieces and sending you information, remember, the final rules haven't come out yet. And we won't know exactly how this law is going to be applied until those rules are written. Just an FYI on the idle loan, um, if you had already gotten forgiveness, forgive me, I have allergies, not illness, allergies. Um, if you've already gotten the forgiveness and had it subtracted, the SBA has been directed to give procedures to the banks so that they can get that money back to you at being forgiven as it should be forgiven. So first cautionary tone is remember the regs haven't been written and we will have to watch carefully. And just because Todd's come through the bill, I've read, looked through all 5,000 pages of it, but it doesn't mean I've been able to tie all the dot knots together and the regulators will do that. We'll see what that looks like. Second, yes, uh, payroll protection will be available again. The loan is going to be available again. Yes, the idle is going to be available again. The portal is going to open. But keep in mind the portals aren't open yet. And they likely won't be for the payroll protection until the banks feel they have the regulations and the rules and they're ready to comply. And the SBA until they have the rules under which the new idle um, can do that. I think what you're going to ex can expect this time like Todd said, they've been through this before. Uh, expect more caution this time. The SBA especially, and the banks, 
received a lot of criticism, not only from the public, but from federal oversight, like the Office of Inspector General. So expect more scrutiny of the borrower as the borrower is qualified. Again, they've gotten a lot of negative feedback on that. So I think this time it will be a little more on the front end to qualify. Example, the new law specifically holds lenders harmless and says the lender can rely on the information that is certified and documented from the borrower. What does that mean? It means the onus is on the borrower. So, Mr. Borrower, Ms. Borrower, as you're putting your stuff together for this, don't depend on your lender telling you, oh yeah, it's okay. Be sure you read those statements that you have to attest to. Be sure you have the supporting information behind it because the banks will not be held liable to do any verification. They're being quote unquote in the law held harmless. So the onus is on the borrower to make sure that they qualify and they read the statements. Another example is after the payroll protection funds, the bar money was out to the borrowers due to a large outcry from companies that the general public felt didn't need the loans they got. Perhaps they had other resources and shouldn't have used taxpayer money. There was a move that now if you borrowed more than $2 million under the original payroll protection, you have to complete an eight page loan necessity questionnaire with all supporting documentation. And the SBA will determine if you're eligible for forgiveness. This is an after the fact uh, statement, an after the fact action. The CARES Act originally came out in April. People were starting to get money April and May. That questionnaire and that requirement came out in October. So I think this time you can expect a little more front end um, process, a little more front end looking because they don't want to be caught as they were the last time with having to put a lot of these things at the back end, which is most onerous for everybody. The other thing is the law states that forgiveness, to actually apply for the forgiveness, this time it's pretty clear in the law, will, it will require the borrower to document the 25% revenue loss. Now keep in mind, this is a loss of top line revenue. As Todd had said, they're looking at the revenue from a quarter in 2020, you should pick the quarter, compared to the same quarter in 2019, and just document you have a reduction, 25% reduction in top line revenue is what's said in the bill. So that doesn't mean your expenses went up and that's why you're losing money or that your supply, your cost of raw materials went up and that's why you're in trouble, or your supply chain broke down because that's why you're in trouble. This is all based on top line revenue. And that's the documentation you'll need to have ready, the warning you up front when you're ready to go in for forgiveness. The other thing that's interesting in the law, and I leave this to the attorneys who are listening to this to figure out what the difference is, but the new law is very specific in saying it's shifting from an eligible entity to an eligible recipient. So again, I leave that to the attorneys to figure out what the difference in that wording is going to mean. We'll see what the, how the regs define it. The other thing is a clarification on, a, on the set-aside. Todd talked about the set-aside, and it's important. It's, real, it's an effort in this bill to make sure that those who might have had trouble access, accessing the funds before can get it. It's meant to make it easier for those who couldn't get it before, or those from economically challenged neighborhoods or minority businesses, but the set aside is not for the business. The set aside is for the lenders who historically focus on economically challenged and underserved communities, minorities. So if you feel this is your best avenue, if you qualify on those terms and you were unable to get it before, your best venue is to seek out the lenders who specialize in underserved markets, uh, minority businesses, small uh, business community, they're the ones who are getting the set aside and have that money. And if it is not used, then it goes back into the general fund for the other businesses. So if you want to get at this quickly, you may want to change lenders and that's permissible. You may want to try a different lender this time. So all that said, there's a lot of good in this bill. And let me touch on a few points that Todd hasn't already covered. Todd talked about the fact that you have 60% of it has to go for payroll, but the other 40% now has a much wider scope. It can go for software and cloud computing for your business operation. It can go for, this is a good one, for many businesses, this was critical. Cost to repair property damaged by vandals and looting caused by public disturbances. Many businesses got hit twice, once by COVID and second by disturbances on their street that damaged their buildings. It allows you to pay for purchase orders and contracts if you had them in place before you started your covered period. And this is an important piece that's different this time. Your covered period starts when your loan is dispersed. 
and it ends when you, the borrower, decides it ends. It has to be at least eight weeks, no more than 24, but you can select when it, choose, when it ends. If you're a business that has perishable things like food, then you can use this money to pay for perishables anytime during the covered period. It also allows, as Todd alluded to, the modification to businesses, drive-throughs, outside dining, plexiglass, and it also allows for ventilation systems. So this gives a lot more flexibility for businesses to spend that money. And it's not clear in the law, but it suggests that those who have not yet filed for forgiveness may be able to include some of these when they're submitting. So people who did not qualify before might under the new. Again, we've got to wait for the regs to come out on that. The other thing is the bill offers some grants to a couple of the hardest hit areas. And these are grants that are directly available from the SBA. You cannot have a grant in tandem with a payroll protection loan but if you qualify for this, it's an avenue you want to look at. If you're a shuttered live venue operation, if you're in transportation, buses, school buses, ships, ferries, think of those things. There are grants available to you directly from the SBA. Lastly, a couple words on idle because there's some really good things that are happening here. The idle loan does not have a requirement that you use it for payroll. So it's a great source. Of, it is a loan but it's a great source of funding for those things if you've pivoted your company and you're heading in a new direction and now you need to fund it. So that portal will be open again and a couple significant things on that. When the idle first came out and the $10,000 grant was approved, the money ran out so fast that SBA had to limit it and say you only get 1,000 per employee. So for example, you have three employees. You got 3,000 instead of 10,000. When the portal reopens, you can apply now for that other 7,000 that you did not get if you have less than 300 employees, you're in a low income census tract. The best way to do that is Google um, new market tax credits and put your address in and see if you fall in that category. And that you've had a 30%, not 25% like payroll protection, but 30% less in top line revenue. You can apply for the rest of that grant. And you can also, if you've not had an idle before, you can apply for it now if all of the above um, are, are met. But you, the biggest thing there is proof for the new idle loans, proof of 30% decrease in top line revenue, business in a new market tax credit census or economically challenged neighborhood. That's not hard. Many businesses may be located in those neighborhoods even though the owners don't live there. The other thing is if you did not get your full advance, it actually says in the law that that will be a priority. That money will go to those folks first who did not get the advance that Congress promised them and then it will go to others. So Molly, that's kind of a wrap up on where I see we're going to be going with this and things we can celebrate and the things we need to be cautious about. And I'll leave it to you to get questions for us from there. Great. Uh, that's really helpful, Marilyn. Thank you. Um, I do want to, I'm going to go ahead and stop the share so that we can all um, have a better conversation in, in the Q and a, um, what I, I wanted to uh, just remind folks, if you if you can please try and use the uh, Q and A uh, platform to answer or to ask your questions, uh, we're getting a lot coming in through that um, that platform, and it just makes it a lot easier for us to um, uh, to prioritize those and make sure that you know the the early bird uh, gets gets their questions answered. So, um, with that, what I'm going to do is go ahead and read out the questions. So, as you you know, if we for some more questions, feel free to put that into the Q and A platform, and if we have time remaining, then we'll try and get to those that have been uh, put through in the chat. So. Uh, without further ado, um, we're going to start up with um, Kathy, uh, and she's asking, are tips included in wages for ERTC? It's the same rules as apply right now under the current payroll protection. So go back into the rules that were written over the summer. There's nothing in the law that changes that. You agree with me, Todd? I do, yeah. Great. Um, she did have a follow-up question about, um, can ERTC be used on, on same wages as PPP? If you're in tax credit, it can now with a new loan. In the past, you could not have payroll protection and the earned tax credit, and the earned tax credit is larger. We didn't cover that with this. It's now $14,000, and it's a refundable tax credit. So you need to be looking into this. Your best source for that is to go to whoever provides your payroll because you apply for this through the quarterly or semi-annual remittance you would do for payroll withholdings and your employer portion of the tax. So your payroll provider will have the forms and the mechanism for you to get this. So it's not something you have to wait to year end for. It's something you can apply for for two quarters when you're submitting your employer payroll tax and your employee withholdings. Great. Uh, the next question is from Brian and he's asking, has it been determined how to calculate the second draw amount? 
Yes, and that's based on, for most companies, it's 2.5 times the annual SAP payroll. Take your annual payroll for 2019, divide it by 12, multiply it by 2.5. If you happen to have a NAICS code, a NICS code, that begins with 7.2, which is hotels, restaurants, the hospitality industry, they're going to be permitted to take the average monthly payroll times 3.5 for a larger loan amount. But still, can, none of them can go over $2 million. Great. The uh, next question is from Jennifer, and she says, how will the payroll be calculated for the maximum loan size? And Marilyn, I think you just touched on that. Is there anything else to add? No, the only caveat is it's the same rule has applied with the original payroll protection is that salaries that are greater than 100000 are only included in the calculation up to 100000 that's just a caveat everyone needs to be aware of. This, the new law does allow a few more insur group insurances and some other things to be added into payroll costs that were not there before. So it's a little more friendly to the amount you can add into payroll, but the basic calculation is the same. Yeah. Right. And again, all this will be spelled out much more detail when we get the regulations. Uh, the SBA had initially told us, just so people are, are informed of when that could happen, that they may even have some regulations available by the end of the day today. I, I kind of honestly expect that deadline to slip a little bit. I'd be really impressed if we got them tonight, but we'll see. And then when we do have those and have a chance to go through them, I think we'll plan to do another one of these so that we can get into some more details and see if there's anything in there that's surprising or concerns us or that we might not have been expecting. The, the law required them to have the regs out within 10 days. And I think the difference is, Todd, whether they were counting 10 calendar days or 10 business right. days. Yeah. And I was tending to give them the benefit of the doubt with 10 business days. I wouldn't want them to get them too fast. I'd rather get them right. Great. Um, we, like I said, if, if you can try and keep your questions into the Q&A platform, that just helps me kind of prioritize what's coming in. Um, the next question is from Michael, and he's asking about loans to solopreneurs. And is that based on prior year profits? And does that mean 2020 or 2019? It's the same rule. And everything that I've seen in the law, and I don't know about Utah. Now, Rick, keep, you all keep in mind. This law was 5,635 pages long. It took me most of the day just to scroll through to find the pieces I needed to read. Uh, so I, we can't be sure we've all seen all of it. But it appears to be everything's based off 2019 and getting relief for 2020. Great. Yeah. The, now, again, uh, the next that I, I should say that that is the kind of thing that they could make a provision for in the regulations. So if there's right. money left into 2021, they I can see them shifting the dates or at least allowing businesses to choose that, but we can't say they're gonna do that yet because it's not in the law, but they may make provision of that in the regulation. Okay. The, the next question, and Todd and Marilyn, it's, it's a very long one. It's from Scott, and it's, a, it's an interesting question. I don't know if you've had a chance to read it, um, but he's asking us to, uh, or asking you as the experts to kind of weigh in on his assumption. So um, if, if you've had a chance to kind of look through, and I know it's hard to do when you're, when you're the expert and, and talking, responding to everything, but um, if you've had a chance to look at that, if you'd like to respond, or if you'd rather just hold off and we can shoot Scott an email once we're uh, done with the webinar, I'll leave that, leave that decision up to you too. I can't see the Q&A from my view. Okay. Well, I can get up the chats, but not the Q&A. Okay. Yeah, I, I will just say I looked at it. I do, was able to see it briefly, but uh, I had to be doing some other things too. So I can't answer in detail, but I think the gist of it, as I recall, is that the bill in addition to the PPV program makes some improvements to the the SB's other lending programs, particularly the 7A loan oh. program, community advantage loans. Um, and those are very, very um, important pieces. I mean, it, it uh, increases the guarantee amount uh, and, and lowers Reduces fees. And that's that's going to help a lot of companies also. Okay. And it also enables new borrowers to take advantage of the same deferment of payment, mm -hmm. which can be huge for a company yep. who's got a future. So many companies are starting out right now from a dead stop. There's no momentum. So if they can get moving forward, cash will follow the momentum and the ability to defer three months or six months can make a difference between that loan making sense or not. Great. Um, hopefully that answers your question, but if it doesn't, Scott, feel free to shoot me an email at mday at nsba.biz and, and we'll be sure to um, make sure we get to, uh, to all your questions. Um, the next question uh, is from Terry and she asks, um, for 2020, are the expensed deductible, are the expenses deductible or does that apply only to round two? No, 
all of them. Right, right, right. Yeah. All of them. Right. Yeah, the law is very clear about that. It's like, we meant this, we meant it, and this is what it is, and it must have been repeated about 10 times throughout the bill. Every time something came up, they repeated again. This is what we meant. Yep. Don't you love it when Congress has to pass the law to tell the legislator, the regulators what they meant? And I got to say, this is one of the clearest victories we've had because yeah. this was something that uh, we really jumped on when the first, when the Irish rules came out. And Congress responded in a bipartisan way. And I got to say, they, they, they pushed back mm -hmm. against Treasury and they kept trying to restrict it and narrow it and say, well, okay, we'll allow deductible for some businesses in some circumstances, if they're not too big, if they're, they're the right as, mm -hmm. NISC codes, whatever. And we're like, no, just fix it. And they did. Yeah. The uh, next question is from Aaron, and I, I think you both probably already alluded to this. Um, uh, are the forgiveness application instructions available yet? Um, if not, when do you expect it will be? I think the big thing for anyone who's concerned about forgiveness is look at what already exists. Again, the law didn't rewrite payroll protection. Right. So I think you can expect it all to be the same. And what I would recommend, if there are things that you found particularly egregious or unfair in the forgiveness process, some of that may be alleviated with the easy simplified application for 100, under 150,000. However, my experience with the government and SBA, a one page application simply means they took it from 12 size font down to 10 and they require six pages of documentation attached to it. So that doesn't necessarily mean it's one page. But if you have an issue with any of that, take advantage of the National Ombudsman's Office and file a comment it's really a complaint, yeah. You because what we're doing there, I now chair the working group for the Regulatory Fairness Board on access to capital, and we're gathering those comments so the ombudsman can put some pressure on regulators for regulation that is harming small business. So if people have issues, they should take a look at sba.gov backslash ombudsman. So one, and that truly is a one-page form. Truly, truly is. You can do it online. That's a way to bring the any issue they're having with the forgiveness process up before those things are refined in the new system. Great. Um, I am getting some some really specific questions, which are great, but I think what I'd like to do, if we can kind of um, jump through some of those and we'll try and respond to those via email. Um, Shannon specifically asked something that, that I think is pretty unique to her situation. Um, so, so we'll try and respond to some of those via email and I wanna move on to some that may have a bit more broad implications for the folks on our call. Um, I, I was hoping to, to stop by about 12.45, but I think we can, get, I'm sorry, by 2.45. Um, I think we can go up to three. Um, so we do have some extra time and if we have time at the end, then um, Shannon will come back to your question and some of the other more specific ones. Um, with that, uh, Natasha asks, will independent contractors participate in the PPP loan process for their own income as they did before? Yes. 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 Same Same question. Easiest question we've had all day, right? Yes. Um, uh, the next one is from Levine. Uh, she says, can you provide more clarification on the idle grant of $10,000? Is this a grant or a loan? It's a grant. It was yeah, the original CARES law, the CARES Act, said it was a $10,000 grant per company. Whether they took an idle loan or not, they were eligible for the grant. Then when there was not enough money, when SBA sat down and looked at the flood of applications and requests, they realized the money they had been allocated was not enough to cover everything. So they limited the amount of grant based on the number of employees a company had. So this bill reinstates the grant for the full 10,000. And that's a grant, that's a grant. It was, the regulations tried to convert it to a loan when they subtracted out of the forgiveness of the payroll protection. And you suddenly found your three, five, six, ten thousand dollar $10,000 grant became a loan under the unforgiven portion. That's now gone. The law has taken that away. So it's a grant. The new law took that provision away. So it's a grant and it will stay a grant. The law is clear on that. Great. Um, the next question is, um, uh, this kind of talks about the period in terms of the look back. Um, and, and, you know, do we know what the period is, is going to be? Uh, and I think Marilyn kind of talked about that we think we know. Um, but until we see the regulations, it's, you know, we still don't know 100%. Um, but uh, Rick also asks, will I need to recall um, laid off employees depending upon when the evaluation period is? I don't know about you, Todd, but my reading of the bill was not clear whether we're doing headcount or full-time equivalents. They simply refer to employees. So the regulations right. will have to sort that out. That's right. And I saw nothing in there that said anything about reduction in staff. But remember, it's saying that everything in payroll protection remains. 
unless we have changed it. So at the moment, we have to work under the assumption that whatever the old payroll protection said that wasn't specifically changed in the bill, it still holds. And that would be reduction in employees. And so if we don't know, the regs come out. Right. And also the thing to bear in mind, of course, is that you can only um, de- use forgiveness for other expenses to the extent you use it for well, at least 60% of it at, at for employee compensation. So if, if you don't have any employees right now, you can't use the, you can't get the forgiveness for your rent and for other things it otherwise would be allowable for, uh, for mortgage interest. Um, so uh, it may behoove you to recall an employee for that reason alone, even if the other reasons don't apply and pay them so that you can use the forgiveness for the, for the full 40% that's allowed. The other thing to keep in mind too, is toward the end of the regulations as we went into forgiveness, there is a safe harbor that if you've called employees back. So if this loan were to enable you to bring people back, there is a safe harbor so you would not be uh, penalized for having had them out of work for a while. Right. Right. And I think Todd and Marilyn both touched on this, but uh, this is a question from Rick. He asks what the SBA is doing for 504 and 7A loans. Um, Before you jump in, if there's anything you wanted to add to that, I do want to mention we have an article on our website that kind of talks about um, the package itself and and outlines some of the changes to the 7A and the 504 program. Um, But Todd, Marilyn, any additional commentary? You want a candid answer? I read some of the changes and I thought that doesn't work well for a 504. Um, it's, It's a paper offer. A lot of the changes they're making, a 504 loan, for those who don't know, is traditionally used to buy a large building or big pieces of equipment. That's what it's for. And this whole idea of some of this stuff that they're putting in there doesn't make sense to the borrowers and the purposes for which they're using it. It does make it a little easier for some refinancing and so forth. So they're trying on the 504. And those who are the 504 experts may find a way to take that try and turn, leverage it into something good. But we'll have to see how that happens. I don't see that being a real big windfall for anybody. Okay, great. Um, Natasha asks a question about chambers of commerce and will they be able to access the PPP and EIDL? And I think Todd touched on this when he mentioned the, the 501c6 changes there. Is there anything else? We've got a couple of other questions about nonprofits and how they're being treated under this round too. So Todd, if you can expand on that a bit. Yeah, actually, I don't think I mentioned it. I think I mentioned it in the chat to somebody in particular, but, but yeah, this, this was a change that we also advocated for. The original PPP allowed only 501c3 nonprofits to participate in the program, which are, you know, charitable organizations, churches, uh, charities. Uh, 501c6 organizations, which almost all trade associations, small local chambers of commerce uh, fit into that category, could not participate at all. Uh, this has been a change. They do allow, allow 501c6s to participate. Uh, only small 501c6s, of course, because it's only for small companies, such as the same size standards as other businesses. Uh, there are some other restrictions, though. Uh, um, specific kind of sports organizations, like the NFL, for instance, which is a 501c6, can't participate, even though they actually, I believe, they do meet the size standard uh, in terms of nerve employees um, as, as an entity of the NFL. Um, but uh, uh, also, organizations that lobby primarily cannot. There's a there's a cap of I believe 10% of revenues that come flow through for lobbying purposes. You cannot get a PPP. Otherwise, and I think this applies to the vast majority of local chambers, they now are eligible for the program, which we think is a is is a reasonable thing because a lot of these chambers are really trying to support their local business communities, trying to create educational programs, trying to bring in new business from the outside. And, and if their business community is struggling and the dues aren't coming in and they can't have events, they can't do their job and advocating for their members. So we think it's appropriate that they're able to be eligible for this. And I've had a lot of questions coming into me from people since this bill was passed, how it's going to change with a nonprofit. And one thing to keep in mind is what we learned from the last round. This loan necessity questionnaire wants to make sure that you don't have large investments, endowments, or other sources, that those should be used first. So I've cautioned a couple of nonprofits that, yes, you've been hurting. It's been very difficult, but you have some very significant investments. And I think you're going to see a greater emphasis on that. Even the SBA has said they're going to review loans under $2 million if they feel that the taxpayer's money came first when it should have come last. Okay. 
Great. Um, this is an interesting one from Nakima. She asks, are there any provisions for businesses that started after January 30th, 2020? Uh, many entrepreneurs started new businesses because of loss of employment. So how, how are they going to be treated under this new round of PPP? The bill states that unless they were in business, I'm digging for the exact date or a certain date, they are not going to be eligible. We'll see if the regulators find a way to tweak that. Um, February. February something of 2019. I don't have it in front of me. I believe it's February 18th. I'm not positive. Yeah, I, I do. I did write that down because it, it was very clear that they will not be eligible. Um, not right in front of me either. Uh, so it's something that we'll see if the regulators don't find it. They did in the past find a way to work around the deadline that was in the law. So we'll see if that's true. Okay. Uh, Gary asks, if you never participated in round one, can you still apply under round one rules, i.e. not 25% in sales requirement? I'm trying to figure that one out. How about you, Todd? I've heard various takes on that because it crosses, I, the, the bill crosses each other. Yeah, I, I believe not um, because the I mean, that, that's the way the language reads to me. We, we will know for sure when the regulations come out. But I, I would assume that you cannot. It might be a nice surprise if you can. But if you can do that, then the other restrictions will apply the things they fix from round one. So you got to decide if they operate two sets of rules simultaneously for people who hadn't applied before, um, which ones would work better for you. But, but given the complexity of that, I, I don't think they will interpret the law to allow that. Yeah, I'm agreeing with you because I've heard several people over the last couple of days say, oh, you can apply again under the original rules. When I sat down and actually read the bill, I thought, how? It, it doesn't make right. sense to do that, no matter how much they might want to. So that's definitely one of those uh, stay tuned. Hopefully we'll have some more. Well, I think this is the other thing, too, to keep in mind. When I mentioned that you can have greater scrutiny this time. In the past, the, the first loan, and again, as Todd said, it was a very short, it was very rushed. We'd, nobody how, knew how long it was going to last. So there was no question about it. If you said you needed it, you got it. And we've seen the witch hunt, trying to find people who others feel shouldn't have gotten it. Everybody's got a different set of opinion. So I think you see a little more scrutiny this time about do they need it. To that point, I would be surprised with Todd that they have maintained two sets of rules. Okay. Um, great. There was a request to repeat um, how people can determine if they qualify for the extra idle loans. Oh, it, they simply, it's called, uh, the easiest way to do it is the new market tax credit. If they go to Google and they Google go new market tax credit, they can put in their address and it will determine if they qualify being, by being in a low income census tract. Great. Um, Gosh, sorry. Let's see. Um, Carol asks, how does a nonprofit apply for payroll protection for leased employees? Can't. You can't. Okay. The people you're leasing them from can get the payroll protection. Right. You can't. Okay. I, and I've seen a couple other questions come in about um, um, independent contractors. Can you touch on that since we're on, on this particular topic real quick? You can't, even though you consider them part of your staff, they're not your payroll, but they can apply independently. And what was so painful with the first round of payroll protection is they were the very last to get the regulations to cover them. And so there are many of them who didn't get it or didn't get as much as they could have been entitled to. They're treated as independent con as uh, sole proprietors. And I've said this before, it's no, it, this is actually in the regulations that came out when they severely restricted what independent contractors or small business owners could have as far as applying for forgiveness and what they could do. The regulation actually says, most of these individuals operate out of their home, their truck or a shed, and we can't let them have a windfall, quote and unquote. So there was not a largesse to make sure these folks got uh, a lot of um, benefit from this. Maybe this round will get a little different. If not, again, that's another place to oppose a regulation that's been unfair. But the intent was you couldn't count them as the owner of the business who used them because they were allowed to go independently for themselves. Maybe not enough, maybe not well, but that was the original intent as far as I understand it. And this law didn't fix that, it's the same. Okay. 
Um, I, I do want to refer uh, folks back to our website. And, and again, we'll, we'll send out this recording as well as the slides. Um, we're getting a couple of general questions about, you know, what are the new qualifications? What are the maximum size of loans? Um, all that information are on these slides. And we, it's also in an article that we posted on our website. It's on the homepage. So you should have no problem finding it uh, in SBA.biz. So I just want to skip through some of those where the information is already available. Um, and like I said, we'll send all this out um, following the, uh, the webinar today. So with that, I want to move on to Jenny's question. And she says, do you only need to experience a 25% loss in one quarter from 2019 to 2020? What if your overall revenue increased from 2019 to 2020, but did decrease by 25% in one quarter? Would you still qualify? We'll wait and see what the regs say. The losses and what used a quarter test. I, how do you feel, Todd? I suspect we're going to see uh, some concern. There's, there are caveats in the new bill about seasonal employers. And these are people who normally would have a low season. And that season may not necessarily be by the calendar. It might be by weather. So I'm expecting some clarifications on that. Right. Um, there could be. I think the law is relatively clear, though. It says quarter, and it says mm -hmm. revenue drop, and it doesn't talk about an annual revenue drop or anything like that. So, um, But again, th as Marilyn says, there were a couple of times last time when the regulators wrote rules that I think were largely disregarded what the law actually said. And they could do that again. And the only way around that is a lengthy challenge in court in other ways, um, which doesn't help us in the near term. I, I think you, you talked briefly about um, seasonality. And this next question from, from Amy is, is asking, is there anything written in the rules or the law that, that addresses seasonal businesses and, and how they can qualify for this? Yeah, the, the payroll protection regulations have lots and lots of information on how to calculate the seasonal businesses. This simply changed by giving them more access to what's available. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how the regs tie together because some, as I read through some of the details in this and tried in my mind to match it to the details of the other payroll protection, um, it's going to take some work before somebody sorts through exactly. But there is a lot, I would start by looking at what's already out there for payroll protection for seasonal employees and then watch for any, they're try, I know they're trying to improve it. So it's a question of if those improvements really make a difference. Todd, what, what's your reading of that? No, I think that's exactly right. Great. Um, the next question in, in Maryland, I think you probably have a pretty unique perspective on this. Um, Larry asks, I've read that some banks are accepting PPP applications and some are not. Will everyone be in the same position when all portals are open? And with your constant contact with banks, Maryland, what are you hearing? Well, right now, no bank is open. No. Period. Nobody's open, all right? And I think you'll find they're going to be slow to open because, again, they're going to want the rules. They're already being caught in the middle of this whole forgiveness thing, and that's been a painful process for them. In some cases, they're having people that they thought were forgiven, and the SBA is changing their mind about it. So I think they're going to be a little slow to open their portals. But from I don't see anything in the, in the law that says they have to use the same lender. So you may want to consider finding a lender that's more appropriate for what you need, where you are now. The fact that the set aside for the community banks, the economic development groups, some of the smaller lenders, and you're, if you're a small business and you need a small amount, it may be worth seeking those people out. Um, on that particular topic, we got a question through the chat from Jerry, and he asks about um, when the rules will be out to the banks, um, and specifically asked about the loans under $150,000 with the easy forgiveness. Do you think there's any different timeline for those loans versus all the others? Well, the, the law set, sets timelines for when they, all of this has to be done, and it goes from 10 days to actual calendar days, like the end of the month. There are all these times that they have to be met. Uh, that what will happen, realistically, having been part of that ping pong match the last time, it'll land in my inbox about 10 o'clock on a Friday night or a Thursday night. Uh, I'll read through it. Everybody's trying frantically to read through it. And it raises, in some cases, more questions than it answers. So then there are inquiries back to SBA to clarify. And then it's back and forth. The only advantage we have this time is the portals have already been designed. They've been built. The lenders have their ID numbers. They've trained their staff. Many of them have COVID response staff that are dealing with all this. All that had to be stand, stood up from the beginning the first time. So once the banks are comfortable, I think you'll see it go much smoother. 
because they have their systems in place. But first, they're going to want to be sure they're understanding the regs. And that's a back and forth, literally. It's a ping pong. It happens in hours sometimes. It happens in days. But everybody's frantic to try to get it understood before they implement it. Yeah. And that's why I think if there's a gray area, I think the regulators will, will err on the side of making them the same as they were before, uh, unless there's a clear change required in the law, just because they don't want to go back and forth. And last time they did, we had updates and changes regularly, <laughs> which was confusing and um, create a lot of dis misinformation or old information for people. Great. We, we're running, running low on time, so we'll try and get through as many as quickly as possible. Um, one question has been asked a couple of different ways, um, but kind of talks about uh, if you got a PPP from round one and you haven't filed for forgiveness yet, um, can you, A, still file, and B, can you um, file for simpler forgiveness under the new program? Yes, you could file. If you, are, if you haven't been forgiven yet, you have to have used your PO protection money, and most people probably have by this point, uh, but you do not have to be forgiven. And many of these rules are, my reading of it, and Todd, you correct me if I'm wrong, but again, guess who's regulators say, some of these expanded uses of the other 40% of the other expenses look like they could be retroactive back to those who are filing for forgiveness now. We're, we're not gonna know for sure until we see what comes out in the regs. Okay. Um, another question was asked about um, using idle for payroll expenses if they don't qualify for a second PPP loan. And Marilyn, I think you talked about the fact that idle is a bit more broad, but there isn't the forgiveness part of idle. Is right. there anything else you want to comment on that? Well, in the beginning, when idle first came out, you could use it for all legitimate business purposes. And some people did use it for payroll. And then when payroll protection came out, they were forced to take the portion of the idle that had been used for payroll and roll it into the payroll protection loan. I understood that. They were trying to get all the payroll in one place. Uh, if you don't get a payroll protection loan this time and you're getting an idle loan, I don't see anything that says it cannot be used for, it's a business expense. And these are legitimate business expenses. Okay. Um, kind of staying on the, on the payroll piece, I'm gonna jump over to the chat question from Bill. Um, and he asks if um, uh, commissions or bonuses are included in terms of the payroll calculation. The same rules that apply for payroll protection, the original one. Uh, there are a little complexity in some of those rules, but they're there. And in general, they do, but not always. Right. Um, so you want to go back and look at those specific rules as they were, and that's in the CARES Act payroll protection. Those haven't changed. Yeah. Okay. Ba basically, the answer is yes, but there are some, as Marilyn says, there's some odd rules that kind of try, they try to prevent sort of weird gamesmanship to the extent they mm -hmm. can think about what people might try to do. Um, so there are some odd rules you should look into, but if you're, if these are sort of normal, regular bonuses like you've always done, probably they're allowable. And, they simply don't want you to pay a year's worth of bonuses in one month so that you can lose it. Right. right. Okay. Um, another question here asks about if, if they did not record any decline in revenue, are they automatically disqualified? Yes. So this is a qualifier this time, yes. And the unfortunate okay. part is, and that's where I would say, the, the unfortunate part is they may have had other disruptions to their business that are mean they're not taking the money home that they need to to support their families and hire people and so forth. But this doesn't address that. This is strictly based off of throughout the bill, the references to a decline in top line revenue. Right. Okay. Uh, another question asks about, um, can the same salary be used for ERTC and PPP, or is that double dipping? Glad to have both. Okay. That changed. That changed. That, that You were not allowed to do that in the past, and you can now have both. Now, there are restrictions for who qualifies for what that are different, but you can have both. You have to disclose okay. you have both, but you have both. Okay. Uh, can companies in Chapter 11 or reorganization apply for the second round of PPP? The new loan actually has a provision in certain conditions, and I didn't read all the detail because I had 300 other pages to read, but there is an entire section on debtor in possession being, being able to get a payroll protection through this new bill. So anyone who is in a bankruptcy should talk to their bankruptcy attorney mm -hmm. because it may jeopardize the bankruptcy if they go out on their own to get this. Because once they've filed a bankruptcy, particularly 11, to work out, they now have to follow the rules of the court and the court's trustee. So don't go rushing out to get one, but check with your bankruptcy attorney. It might be funding to help you exit successfully from chapter 11. Okay. 
Um, another question asks about headcount figure and to forgiveness. Um, Rick says he had nine full-time employees in 2019 and he has two now. It talks about number of employees to qualify back to the original rule. If it's gonna defer back to what was originally with payroll protection, you originally got qualified based on number of employees and you're forgiven it based on headcount. So I would, uh, if anybody going in now, uh, take a look at full-time equivalents. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question from Natasha is, do they know when the PPP forgiveness reporting period is? 24 weeks or is it something different? You get to pick. That's, yeah. what's, that's what changed with the law. It has to, you, it starts, that's, that's a man, it's given. It's mandated by law. It starts when your loan is dispersed, originated. Then you can choose eight weeks minimum, 24 weeks maximum. But if you look and say, well, based on the money I got, I'm going to have this totally covered in 12 weeks. Then that's the end of your cover period. You're done reporting on it. You can file for your forgiveness and you'll be done. So you get to pick the covered period this time. Some of my clients preferred the 24 week because it let them get 100% forgiveness because it's 100% payroll. Others chose a shorter period because they knew they couldn't keep the employees on any longer, but they were stuck with either eight or 24. They couldn't do something in between. This lets the borrower determine the covered period. Minimum of eight weeks, maximum of 24. Okay. Great. I think, um, I know there are still some questions we haven't gotten to. Um, we'll do our best to respond to those uh, via email. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, Marilyn and Todd, as always, your insight is, is particularly helpful. Uh, and, and hopefully everybody on the call found it useful. Uh, we will be making the recording as well as the slides available for this later this afternoon. Um, just give us a little bit of time. It takes takes the uh, the squirrels that run the internet uh, some, some time to get the, uh, the video all downloaded, but we will make it available to everybody. Um, I do encourage you to check out our COVID resource page. It's available from our homepage. Uh, we also have a ton of information on the homepage. We're putting out um, new information as we get it, um, if not weekly, then daily. And, um, you know, I really appreciate everybody's time. We know it's, uh, it's, it's a weird time for everybody. We know things are tough and uh, we're in the fight with you. And, um, you know, we're here as a resource and, and really appreciate everybody being with us. And again, uh, Todd and Marilyn, thank you. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. thanks. Bye, everybody.